Well, let's open up our Bibles this morning to Ephesians in chapter number six. And this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to finish off this uh, book, this letter, this epistle, this great um, portion in, in the Bible. Ephesians is um, one of the, uh, for me personally, and I know for a lot of people, just one of the greatest uh, epistles in the New Testament, one of the letters uh, to go to and refer to for uh, just not only just theological purposes, but for, ver for very practical purposes of how to live a life as a believer in Jesus Christ. And um, so uh, what an exciting book to go through. And I would encourage you guys, if you want to ever brush up on what we've been going through and um, go back and refer to one of the... Um, one of the chapters or portions in the scripture, just go to our website or go to the YouTube channel. All the, um, all the um, sermons are up there so you can kind of just brush up on it and stuff. But today in Ephesians in chapter number six, verses 21 through 24, we're gonna complete the chapter today. Today's uh, title is Grace Changes People. Grace changes people. And man, when I think of that, how grace changes people, I'm like, yes, Lord, amen. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for your grace. You know, there are plenty of uh, plans that people make in life to, to change their life, you know, and a lot of times, the, and the change really, people desire change because there's something going on on the inside. You know, it's like, I, I got to change my life. You know, there's something here. And, you know, so there's a lot of plans that people have. You know, there's, there's, um, there's meal plans, right? Because people want to change their life and they want to get a little healthier. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, there's, so there's meal plans that people follow. There's uh, fitness plans that people follow because, you know, maybe they think, uh, you know, they want to get stronger. And again, nothing wrong with that at all. I think, you know, that's something good for all of us to, to be mindful of. You know, as after all, you know, God has given to us this body and God says that our bodies are like the temples of the Holy Spirit, right? And, and we got to keep our, our, our health and, and nice and strong, right? But sometimes people get into this desire to change in that way uh, because they feel it's going to, well, it's going to change them and who they are on the inside, right? Sometimes people have plans to relocate. You know, I just got to move out of here. I cannot tell you how many times I've had conversations with people in Santa Ana that born and raised in Santa Ana. And they're like, man, I, all I know is, man, I just got to get out of here. I got to get out of Santa Ana. You know, like if that's going to change their circumstances or it's going to change who they are on the inside. Or sometimes they'll say, I got to change my profession or I got to change my job. I, I can't work here no longer. I got to change. I got to, you know, move to a different department or something like it's going to change what's going on on the inside. And again, I'm not saying to have a desire to change in those ways. I'm not trying to say that those are bad things, but if we, as God's people, are seeking to change what's going on in here by changing what's going on on the outside, think it's going to work its way in. Guys, that's not how it works. It's not how it works. You see, it, it's the Spirit of God. God's Holy Spirit. God, the person of the Holy Spirit, is who does the change in people's lives. The change that people seek and, and desire and the change that people need. And it happens on the inside. And it's through God, the Holy Spirit. He does that change. Amen? And, and so, and it just works its way out. So listen, if you're like, well, I'm trying to change my job right now. I'm not trying to say, I'm not telling you that's a bad idea. I pray that God you know, opens up those doors for you. But if there's something else that's going on on the inside here, and let me tell you something, as I know this for, for sure, that every single one of us here in this room, we all have something going on in here. You know, why? It's be, how do I know this? Because we're all human. Right? We're all human and we all have stuff. We all have challenges. We all have our battles and we seek those things or we desire those things to change. You see, and so today we're gonna to be focusing on that. And so the letter as a whole though, this book of the Bible, Ephesians as a whole, as we've been going through this here, um, God, through the Apostle Paul, who's writing this letter um, to the Ephesians, Wants, us, wants them and us to understand the riches we have in Christ Jesus. 
right? The riches we have in Christ Jesus. So the purpose here overall really is like God wants us to understand or God wants the, you know, the Ephesians, the church there in Ephesus to understand, hey, people there in Ephesus, there in, in the part of Asia today would, Ephesus would be today in modern day Turkey, okay? The, the country of Turkey, um, that's where Ephesus would be. And so that church there, you know, God would want them to understand the riches they have in Christ Jesus. And when a person understands the riches that they have, you know, remember the first several chapters in the book of Ephesians as we've been going through is really their, their position, who you are. You know, you're, you're seated in Christ. You're in Christ Jesus. And then from that, knowing, you know, where, who you are in Christ then there's a response to action, right? Or your practice. And so your position as Christians and then your practice as Christians. You know, I'm gonna put to action, you know, who I know I am in Christ because my identity is found in Christ Jesus. I am now in the Lord. And then as we close the past couple of weeks, we were looking at the warfare, the battle that we go through, right? And, and so it's not, it's not easy to say, oh, okay, hey, listen, I'm, I'm written, my name is written in the book of life. I'm in Christ Jesus. I have all this instruction now how to live my life, right? As a child of God, as a, you know, I'm gonna imitate God, you know, um, and, and, and as a child of God. So it's gonna be that easy. No, how many of us can say, oh, no, it's not that, it's not easy, right? It's not easy to do this. And so what God gives to us in, the, in chapter number six of Ephesians, again, what we've been going through the past couple of weeks is the spiritual battle because God wants us to understand he's not going to leave us alone without any equipment in the battlefield of our Christianity because there is forces that are coming against you and coming against me, whether you know that or not. Whether you want to believe that or not, and I pray that every single one of us believe that, that there is that the spiritual battle is real, Right? And so God doesn't leave us empty handed though. There's an armor that we have to, 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 to be in the battle, to stand. The purpose is to stand, to withstand the wiles of the devil, the schemes and the trickery that the devil has to cause us to compromise in our walk with God. And, and that's a big issue in the Christian you know, church in the world today, the Christian world today, is that there's a lot of compromise within the body of Christ. You know, it's like, oh, I'm just going to go ahead and do this and do that. Let me tell you something. Um, we have to really have the armor of God on so that we can say, you know what? I don't want to compromise in my walk with God because this spiritual battle, it is real. And the devil is out to destroy you. Believe it or not, the devil is out to destroy you. So God gives to us the, the, the equipment, the, the, uh, the armor of God so that we can stand and withstand the trickery of the devil. That's what we've been going through these past several months here in the book of Ephesians. And, and today we're gonna close this letter starting off at verse number 21. So um, Ephesians chapter number six, starting at verse number 21. And I'm gonna read from the New King James translation. And this is what it says. It says, but to, excuse me, but that you also may know my affairs and how I am doing, Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make all things known to you. Circle those words, beloved brother and faithful minister, there in your Bible. And he says, so I'm sending to you uh, a beloved brother, Tychicus, and a faithful minister in the Lord. He will make all things known to you, whom I have sent to you, verse 22, for this very purpose, that you may know our affairs and that he may comfort your hearts. Peace to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with you all. Be, grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. And that word in sincerity, some of your Bibles, if you have a, a, a NIV, might say um, un, undying love, in sincerity or incorruptible love. Okay, so let's take a look at this here as Paul here, who's writing this portion in the Bible, he's, he's ending the letter, okay? This is it, his, the final greetings, if you will, and the final blessings for, for the church. And how he does this is he sends a messenger, as we see there in verse number 20, uh, 21, the messenger. Now remember, the apostle Paul, who's writing this to that church, uh, he's in prison, 
okay? He's in prison there in Rome, all right? So he's in custody, and, um, and so he's, he can't really do much, obviously, because he's in custody this way. And closing this letter, we're, we're introduced now to a, a man named Tychicus. And this was a man that Paul trusted and, and, and that he, you know, enjoyed to have around because while he was an asset to the work there of the ministry and his name is Tychicus. And now for some of us, we, this is the first time you ever hear that name Tychicus and I don't even know if I'm pronouncing his name right, you know, um, but that's his name. I think that's how you pronounce it um, anyways. But he's really not that well known, right? It's like really, um, we don't know about him. Now, he might be, you know, we do know this, that Paul, he is mentioned being with Paul in the book of Acts in chapter number 20 there in verse number four. You can look at it during Paul's third missionary journey. And they're on their way back, I believe, to Macedonia as the Spirit of God was guiding and, and directing and leading them. And um, Luke, who writes um, the book of Acts tells us that Tychicus was with the Apostle Paul during this time. You know, there was a group of, of people that, were, that was going with them. And so um, he, here he is with Paul there in Rome, you know, there in the prison. Now, perhaps he was, you know, um, uh, just he was a scribe writing the letter, you know, for the most part for the Apostle Paul. We know that that often happened as Paul would dictate to whomever would be writing the letter. And then Paul at the end of the letter would often in his own handwriting begin to write, you see. And so, um, but here what Paul is doing, he's going to send Tychicus, right? Probably uh, he is from Ephesus. We, don't, we do know that he's from Asia, all right? And, and Ephesians, Ephesus would be a, a city there in um, Asia, the area of Asia at that time. So we do know that. So he might be from, um, from, uh, from Ephesus. But when we think of this man, he was a, Tychicus, he was a trusted and important ordinary person. He was a trusted and important ordinary person. That's who he was. He wasn't a superhero. He wasn't like this guy who had, you know, like a, a just, hey, I'm going to get everything done. And, and, you know, that was sought out to, maybe we got to, we can't do anything unless we have Tychicus. No, that's not how it was. He was just an ordinary guy, you know, that was trusted and important for the sake of the gospel, for the purpose of the gospel. And, and I, I really appreciate this because here he is, just an ordinary guy. And friends, let me tell you something. That's who God uses. God uses ordinary people. You don't have to be a superhero. You don't have to have like all of this, you know, uh, this kind of a, a pedigree type of a background for God to use you in a mighty and powerful way. God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. You know, and not just Tychicus, but we, when you do a study and you begin to look at the disciples, the men that Jesus chose when he was there in Galilee, and he's just walking on the Sea of Galilee, and he goes and says, hey, follow me. You know, he tells to Peter, or actually he says, to, he says this to Andrew, and Andrew goes and gets his brother Peter. They were fishermen, you know? It's like, what did they know? They knew how to fish, Right? Um, they, he calls Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector, you know? And, and so all these ordinary guys, but God used them in extraordinary ways. And this is who God uses. And I, I hope and pray that this is something that's encouraging to you here this morning, that, that you can say as you look to yourself, because you know, we're all ordinary people. You know, there's, none of us have, you know, none of us have a cape and fly in the middle of the night, Right? <laughs> None of us have that secret life of, you know, being that, that superhero, you know, that's only in the movies. We're all just ordinary folks, you know, just doing ordinary things, just living our life and going through the battles and challenges of our life, you know, but that's who God uses. You see, but here's the thing is that, that Tychicus was the type of guy, I, I really see a lot like in, I, I'm reminded of, of, of Isaiah in chapter number six, as Isaiah was a prophet in the Old Testament. 
And as he was there prophesying, he had this, he had this vision of God seated high on the throne. And, and the train of his, the Bible says, and the train of his robe filled the temple with glory. And so actually Isaiah was able to see the throne of God, the throne room of God, and, and, and everything was thundering. And, and the angels, he sees the angels, the seraphim angels. And, and, and it was at that moment when Isaiah says, Lord, you know, forgive me. He actually confesses and repents from his sin. And then we're told in Isaiah in chapter number six that Isaiah hears this conversation that God is having with God the Spirit and God the Son, the, the, the Holy Trinity. It's like, whom shall go for us and whom shall we send? And Isaiah hears this and he's like, well, Lord, here am I, send me, I'll go, you see. And so the Lord sent him to go and do his work, right? And that's kind of a lot like with Tychicus and many others. You know, it's just, you know, sensing, you know, the call of God or understanding the need of God in life or the need, you know, to serve the Lord. And it's like, hey, I don't really don't have any much, I don't have much skill. I don't have this background. I don't have this, but you know, Lord, I'm available, would you use me? And God would say, yes. You know, and, and so that's really who Tychicus, you know, where he's taking the opportunity to serve the Lord and he becomes a very trusted and important person for the sake of the gospel, for the purpose of the gospel. Let me tell you something, friends. God wants to use you in that same way that he used Tychicus here for the sake of the, of the gospel, for the advancement of the gospel. We know that Tychicus was also used to take the letter that Paul wrote to the church in Colossae as well. And so that's why we have the book of Colossians. Can you imagine if, if, if Tychicus was a flake? How many of us know flakes? So we know flakes. How many of us are flakes? Don't raise your hand. You see, imagine if he was a flake. We would never have the, 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 the letter to the Ephesians. We wouldn't have the letter here, you know, to the, to the Colossians. We wouldn't have the letter to Timothy because, you see, Tick, he was an important man, you know, for the purpose of the gospel. And that's how God wants to use you. You know, for the advancement of the gospel. Well, where does God, how does God want to use me? At your job, your workplace, within your family, your children, your neighbors. How many of us go out of our way just to, you know, when we see our neighbors outside watering the lawn, just say, you know what, I'm just gonna go talk to my neighbor and invite them to church. You know, that's a scary thing, right? Because, well, dude, that's my neighbor though. You know what I mean? I don't want eggs in my front door, you know? And it's like, no, hey, listen, we should be, see, now I believe, truly believe that Tychicus understood the importance of eternity and the importance of getting God's work done. And so, we should, so should we understand the importance of eternity because if we're not sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with somebody, we don't know if they've ever heard or been, been asked if they wanted to receive the Lord. And their life might be required of them the next day. You see, and you and I, we have that opportunity to be proclaimers of that message. You know, taking God's word to the hearts and lives of people. You see, and you don't have to be, an, uh, you know, a superhero to do it or have, you know, a pedigree type of background. Ordinary people for the sake and purpose of the gospel, that's who God uses. And we see this here with Tychicus. And Paul goes on to describe him as a beloved and faithful minister. I hope you underline that in your Bibles right there. Beloved, and he's a beloved brother and a faithful minister. What? a reputation that Tychicus has, right? Imagine that kind of a reputation. Hey, who's, who's Tychicus? Oh man, dude's a beloved brother and faithful minister. Imagine that on his, man, I would love to have that in my headstone, right? Who wouldn't? You know, here lies, you know, Tommy, a beloved brother and a faithful minister. Boom, that's it. You know, that's all I need. You know, I just, and, and, and that's what we, that's who we want to be. That's, at least that's who we should be. We all should aspire and desire to, to be that. You know, the, a beloved and faithful minister of God. So beloved brother, the Bible is declaring him as to be a loving man, Tychicus. He's a loving man, kind and gentle. The love that God had for him is the same love that flowed through him. The love that God had for Tychicus was the love that flowed through him. You know, there's something powerful 
being around people that have the love of God flowing through them. There's something powerful and, and wonderful about that. I was thinking about this yesterday as I was sitting down and just preparing this. And, and um, you know I, who came to mind? Was my wife. Many of you know my wife, Diana. Some of you don't know her. And maybe you've seen her around and, and everything. But I can tell you, um, she's got the love of God flowing through her. You know, she just loves people and she's genuine. She's authentic, you know, and, um, and I got to tell you, it, it just, it ministers to me, you know, because I, I watch her as she serves. I watch her, you know, and she's like, as she serves here at the church, how you see her here at the church is how she is at home. You know, she's just the, she's the same. You know, what you see is what you get. She's, she runs circles around me, you know, literally, you know, and, but she does it, you know, being compelled by the love of God. And, and I got to tell you, man, there's, there's, there's something powerful and wonderful about, you know, being around her and watching her. And it's just, it's inspiring, inspiring to me, you know, and I know that it's inspiring to other people as well. And I, I, I know that if she was here right now, she would probably say, stop it, you know. But um, that's, the, that's who I think of. But there's many of you are the same way. You know, it's the love of God flowing through you. And, and this is who Tychicus is. The love, the same love that God is loving him with is flowing out of him. You know, this, this authentic and genuine love, you know, for people. But he's not just described as a, uh, as a, as a beloved brother. He's also described as a faithful minister. Faithful minister. Faithful. What is faithful? Faithful is that long-term service, right? That long-term service. A lot of times people will say, hey, man, I'll be there. I'll show. And maybe they might show up that one day, you know, or the next day for a couple of weeks. And all of a sudden it's like, hey, what happened? You know, where's, where's he at? Or where's she at? I don't know. Hey, it fizzled out. See, and, and the faithful, faithful is like, man, it's that long-term service, you know, in the good and in the bad. And many, many people in the church have great dreams for God. Great dreams, you know, maybe like dreams to be a missionary, dreams to, you know, really grow in their theology. And I want to learn as much as I can because I want to, I want to share as much as I can with people. So I want to do this, right? I want to go there and I want to do that. And they have the dreams which are good for the purpose of the kingdom and, and want to be a blessing to God, right? But there's no faithful follow through. They dream big for the Lord, but there's no faithful follow through. Listen, serving the Lord, it's not an easy thing. A lot of times people think it is. I'll get questions sometimes. Hey, oh, so you're a pastor. Oh, wow. How many, how many days do you go play golf? I'm like, what? Dude, number one, I don't play golf. You know what I mean? I don't watch golf. I don't like golf. You know, for you golfers out there, hey, it's all good, right? But I don't have, you know, so, but that's the idea a lot of times people may have. You know, so it's not easy. It's, 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 a, it's really a grind every single day. And it's about being faithful to just wanting to serve the Lord. And it's fall, faithfully falling, following through on what God's called you to do, even for those dreams. And let me tell you something. Maybe I believe that some of you are dreaming big. And I hope and pray that you do dream big. Dream big. You know, Hudson Taylor has this quote, dream a dream so big that unless the Lord intervenes, it'll be impossible. Dream a dream so big that unless the Lord intervenes, it'll be impossible. In other words, hey, listen, dream big and allow the Lord to guide you and to lead you in it. Because when he's in it, it's all possible, amen? All things are possible through Christ Jesus. You see, and so dream a dream so big, but to make, you know, for dreams to become a reality, it takes long-term commitment and hard work. Long-term commitment and hard work. It does. You know, that's, that's how dreams come, come to life. That's how they come to life. And in this age of social media, it seems that people 
are more impressed with the clever caption or with a funny meme rather than the faithful, long-term, unnoticed service to Jesus. Unnoticed on earth, but every service that we do that's in, you know, here on earth is noticed in heaven. Everything you do in the name of Jesus and for the purpose of the gospel is, is seen in heaven and is celebrated. But it seems that in our world today, people are more impressed you know, with the quickness of, of social media, the clever comment, you know, that funny meme or whatever it is. And then the next thing you know, five minutes later, you forgot all about it and you're looking for the next one. Looking for the next one or trying to think of that next clever comment. While all the while that faithful servant of God is there just faithfully serving the Lord and he's going and she, he or she is going unnoticed in the world, but making a difference for the sake of the kingdom of God. Friends, let me share this with you. And that in much, and, 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 uh, and in a lot of ways, that's how Tychicus is. He's that faithful servant, bond servant of the Lord. And I pray that none of us would miss, that none of you would miss out on the miracle of service in the church. Believe it or not, there are many people, there are plenty of men and women here at Hope Alive that are faithful servants. Beloved brothers and sisters and faithful servants of the gospel. How do I know? Because they're here every Sunday. Every Sunday, a handful of you and you know who you are. They're here on Sunday mornings early, unloading a truck, setting the chairs up, putting the lights up, setting this audio up, getting the rooms ready, sweeping out there, cleaning, cleaning the table so there's a clean table for you to sit on. Remember, don't forget, this is a junior high school, so junior hires, anyways, that's a whole other subject. Cleaning the bathrooms, making sure that there's toilet paper and, and there's napkins and that it smells good in there. We're doing the best we can, at least. Cutting the bread and donuts, making sure there's coffee and water. See, we all know, listen, I know that you know this. That stuff just doesn't appear. Putting up the, you know, all everything around us. It just doesn't appear. Faithful men and women of God here at Hope Alive Church are doing that. And for those of you who, who faithfully serve in that way, I say thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Those that are serving in the children's ministry right now, watching our, loved, our beloved treasure, our children right now, faithfully serving. Don't, church, listen, don't miss the miracle of a faithful servant that's happening around us. It's a wonderful thing. And here's the thing. There's room for more here at Hope Alive Church. Amen? And I don't know about you, but I get excited about that because I can just envision every single one of us saying, all right, I want to do that. I want to faithfully serve the kingdom of God for the purpose of blessing one another here in the church. See, the word minister here in, in the Bible, in, in the Greek language is diakonos, where we get the word deacon. And that's really what it means. It means servant. And this is who Tychicus is. He was an ordinary guy. He wasn't a superhero, an ordinary guy just yielding to the Lord. An ordinary guy yielding, God, here I am, send me. What is it that you would have me to do? And I want to faithfully serve you. You know, because sometimes people will raise their hands because it sounds good. You know, I want to serve the Lord. It sounds good. And it's like there's, there's this idea, you know, of, of being a servant of the Lord that's kind of glamorized within the church. Well, that's okay. Let me tell you something. Don't glamorize it. Do it. Don't glamorize the idea. You know, I have, I've heard Pastor George say this. Don't talk about it. Be about it. Don't talk about it. Be about it. Do it. Serve the Lord and be faithful in it. And here, this is who uh, Tychicus is. He's just a faithful, ordinary man who's just yielding to the Lord. And God uses ordinary men and women to do extraordinary thing for him. And you know what that, I just think of that as like, man, there's hope for us. <laughs> there's hope because all of us here, we're all ordinary people. I don't see anybody walking in with a cape. Let me see. Yep, no one has a cape here. We're all ordinary people. 
That means there's this hope for us, that God can use us in, in awesome ways. Well, this is who Tychicus is. That faithful servant, that, that, that beloved brother, got the love of God flowing you know, through him to deliver this letter, right? But what's the purpose? And here we have the purpose of, wh of why he sends, he's sending Tychicus. Look with me. Um, he says there in verse number 21, that you also may know my affairs and how I am doing, right? And there in verse number 20, 22, he says, um, I'm sending him, I sent him to you for this purpose that you may know our affairs and that he may comfort you. And so the reason why he's going for, number one, to inform and number two, to comfort. That word in some of your Bibles and translations might say to encourage. And so to inform and encourage you, this is the purpose of why I am sending Tychicus, him personally to you, church there in Ephesus, to inform you and to encourage you. To inform. He was sent to let the people know the welfare of, of Paul, like what's going on with Paul, to personally bring them up to date, to bring them up to speed, up to date on what's going on with the Apostle Paul as he's being in prison there in Rome. And, you know, obviously you know that this can be a time now that he, they can ask him questions. Hey, how's Paul doing? What's going on? And there's that personal relationship to inform, right? And I think this is a good thing for us to understand. You know, we need to be informed, don't we? We need to be informed of what's going on in the world. So we have the news. But we also need to be informed what's going on in the church. What's going on with God's people. Guys, let me tell you something. I don't think that we should be people, you know, God's people should not be ignorant to what's going on in our world we should not be ignorant of what's going on in the church and we should not be ignorant of what God, what the purpose that God has for us as a church to make a difference in the world. You see, we don't let the world dictate, we should not let the world and the, the circumstances and all the challenges of the world dictate to us of what we do and how we do it. We should look to God's word to guide us and to lead us and to go out to be faithful ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because if you were to do a comparison of what was going on in Rome and, and what's going on in our world today, there's a lot of similarities. And actually what was going on in Rome was a lot worse than what's going on in our world today especially for Christians. And what was Paul's motive? What was God's call for the church was to go out and make disciples of all nations. God did not say to the church, hey, go out there and protest. Go out there and do this. You know, go out there and stand up on your soapbox and, and you know, and, and have a political position and be very conservative. And you do, God did not say that. God says, hey, you go out and you make a difference in the life of a person. And you tell them that I love them. Make disciples of all nations. And that's what we're called to do. And we can faithfully do that, friends, when we are properly informed of what's going on. And here, the, the, the church there in Ephesus is getting this information. And Paul is sending Tychicus to inform the church of what's going on, to have some personal understanding. And so that brings us even to this idea, you know, for us practically, of what's going on here in, at church, at Hope Alive Church of knowing what's happening, all the opportunities, number one, to serve, the opportunities to, to be blessed and, and um, you know, to our prayer meetings that we have every Friday, where they're gonna be at. Thursdays, with the men getting together. Men, I would challenge you. You're informed today, all of you men. I would challenge you to get involved with other men. Pray with other men. Fellowship with other men. Women, to, you know, every Thursday, you know, every other Thursday getting together. Tuesday night Bible study. So there's, there's things that are going on for, the, for us to grow into fellowship as a body of Christ. Not just so that we can grow intellectually in the things of God, but so that we can grow as a body and our relationships can get built up and our friendships can get stronger in the Lord so that we can have a, a more of a, a, a powerful impact in the community in which we're called to serve. That when we, when we do go out in our communities, you know, whether, whether you live in Tustin or Santa Ana or Orange or Anaheim or, you know, Bellflower or Downey, Corona, Riverside, wherever it is, that you can say, you know what, God's called me to do this. And I've been informed of what's going on and I want to faithfully serve God. So we have this. 
And also, so not only was he sent, the purpose was to inform, but also to encourage, to encourage them. You know, not knowing, not having information, not knowing what's going on often leads to fear, doesn't it? Not knowing, it leads to fear. Yesterday, before our foundations class that we're having on Saturday mornings, um, I was there early and I had a chance to talk with a security guard that was there and, and we were talking about what's going on with the weekend and, and you know, with this long weekend that we have and he began to tell me that he, had, that he, not only did he serve in the Marine Corps, but his sons are currently serving in the Marine Corps and he was telling me that his sons were also um, in the past, you know, 10 years or so have been active in, uh, in Afghanistan and one of his sons is in the Marine Corps, he's, a, is, he's in, um, with the black ops, you know, so doing a lot of, you know, just uh, covert missions, if you will. So there would be, you know, weeks on end where he would not get any, any information you know, of how his son was doing. And, you know, not knowing, not having information, he would tell, he was telling me that his, um, his wife and, and him were, were, they would just like have sleepless nights. That every time the phone would ring, they would just be gripped with fear. Like, oh, we don't want that phone call. You know, so not knowing brings a lot of fear. Some of us have teenagers, teenagers that drive. And sometimes if, you know, your kids are gone and they're driving and, you know, it's getting like 9.30, 10 o'clock. And it's like, oh man, where are they? How come they're not here now? You know, and you kind of get worried, right? That fear comes. Well, nowadays it might be a little bit different because of, because of technology. We can go to our phones like, oh yeah, they're 10 minutes away. <laughs> but not knowing does bring this, this fear of, you know, in our hearts. And so... Paul is sending Tychicus to give them for the purpose of information to inform and also to encourage them, to encourage that things are going to be okay. You see, Paul loved, as we see, Paul loved these people there in Ephesus. The gospel changes lives and the gospel continues to change lives. And this new relationship was important to Paul. Remember, in, in, in chapter number two, in verse number 15, Paul was talking about this, this new humanity. You know, Jews and Gentiles coming together under the banner of Jesus Christ to form the church, the body of Christ. And Paul refers to it as a, a new humanity, right? And so this new humanity is important to Paul. And the same way, it was important for the Ephesians as well. You see, Paul is not writing this letter to the Ephesians just because, you know, here, let me just write a, a just because letter, you know. There was a purpose behind it. See, and for us today, we shouldn't just talk about our faith as in, like, oh, our faith as in theory, you know. Talk about Christianity only in theory. We, again, we shouldn't talk about it. We need to be about it. We, need, we should be living out our faith as Christians. You say that you're a Christian. You say that you love Jesus Christ. Well, listen, my encouragement to you was to, as to, for you to ask the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, to actually live it out. I want to live out my faith. I want to be able to say and identify areas in my life that are weak and, and I'm challenged in and to say no and ask God, God, would you help me? Because I don't want to be drawn to that any longer. I want to live my life to bring glory to you. That's living out your faith as unto the Lord. We should be living it out. And that's the whole idea here with Paul's letter to the Ephesians. He wants them to understand who they are in Christ and how to live now in Christ and understand, hey, there's going to be that battle, but God has not left us alone. He's given us the armor of God to go out and to fight this battle and to stand our ground, to withstand the, the, the wiles of the devil and those darts that are constantly thrown at us. You see, that's what God wants us to understand. And then we have this final blessing that Paul gives to the Ephesians here. Look at verse number 23. He says this, he says, peace to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity, amen. Listen to that verse right there. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. Paul's blessing. Now his blessing, his desire, or his prayer, Paul's heart for the people is that the church would understand the peace, love, and grace of God. 
the peace, love, and grace of God. Now these words, grace, peace, and love, they, 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 Paul starts this epistle in chapter number one, there in the beginning, with these words. You would actually find these words threaded throughout this letter like a continual theme of peace, of love, and of grace. You would, I, I challenge you, go through it and just see how often you find these words of grace, peace, and love. And here in verse number 24, it says again, this sincerity. It ends with that word, sincere, you know, it, uh, that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. And again, some of your translations might say undying love or incorruptible love, which I think is a, a better translation of this word. The idea, again, is, is incorruptible or in undying love. And this un incorruptible and undying love, friends, this, this word is, in, is written very emphatically, very passionately. In other words, Paul is serious when he writes this, this portion as he ends this letter, you know, here, in sincerity, undying love, right? Uncompromised or incorruptible love. And this highlights, this incorruptible love highlights the incorruptible flow of God's grace. It highlights the incorruptible flow of God's grace. Friends, this letter might be ending here, but the flow of God's grace never ends. We might be done with Ephesians, but God's grace is nev does never stop it never stops. Think of God's grace as that gentle wave that continues to crash upon the beach, right? As just wave after wave. Some of us right now are just imagining the sound of a, of a wave just gently crashing there on the beach. Morning, noon, and night. Rain or shine, summer or winter. It never stops. That wave keeps on just crashing and that's the grace of God continuing just to overwhelm and to flow in our lives crashing against the beach of our hearts if you will that's God's grace and so this incorruptible flow or in incorruptible love of God highlights the incorruptible flow of God's grace that never ends and in Jesus there's an endless supply of God's grace. In Jesus, there's an endless supply of God's grace. Being in Jesus. Again, Paul, in the beginning of this letter, highlights, you know, and, and, and is emphasizes our position for the Ephesians and also for us. Guys, you are in Christ. When you say, Jesus, would you forgive me of my sin? You are then now in Christ. You are in him, seated in Christ the Lord Jesus. I challenge you to go through the epistle, the whole epistle, and circle that preposition word, in, or any other preposition, with, and find out how many times you would find that word there. And our, friends, listen, our identity is in Christ. As a Christian, our identity is in Christ because of his grace. Only because of his grace, our identity is in him. Our identity is no longer, listen, as, a, as someone who said yes to Jesus, our identity is no longer in our sin, no longer in our pain, no longer in our poverty, no longer in our past. Our identity is found in Christ. And unless God the Holy Spirit opens our eyes to this, it won't make sense. Unless the Holy Spirit opens your eyes, the eyes of your heart to the fact that I am now in Christ, my identity is in Christ because of his grace. If the Holy Spirit is not going to open your eyes, the eyes of your heart to that, my friends, it's not going to make sense to you. You're still going to be stuck in your, being identified in your past, being identified in your pain, being identified in your poverty in the sense of being poor in spirit. And you're going to ask the question, why? What's going on in my life? I would challenge you and encourage you to ask the Holy Spirit to open the eyes of your heart. That you would see and understand the grace of God. 
that you would understand then, because when someone understands the grace of God, oh, my friends, then you are understanding I am in Christ. And that means this unity with Christ, this oneness. You see, it's the grace of Jesus that defines us, and it's not our faults and our failures. It's the grace of God. And that grace of God changes things. The grace of God changes things. This union with Christ, you see, that's what happens. It produces this union. We have this understanding, which by the way, this coming Tuesday at Bible study, we're gonna have, I believe this Tuesday is the last Tuesday of the month. I'm not sure. I might be wrong. Correct me if I'm wrong. It is this last Tuesday. We have communion. And this is one of the reasons why communion service should be to you as a believer in Jesus Christ extremely important because we get to celebrate the union with Christ. We get to commune with him and identify with him. And so this communion with God, this union, it changes things all because of God's grace. God's grace. Friends, it's an amazing thing. Sometimes it's so, it's kind of, in, you can comprehend it unless the Spirit of God opens your eyes to it. God's grace is his undeserving favor for you. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. But God says, I'm going to do it anyways. God says, you're the one that should be on the cross, but I'm going to go to the cross for you. See, God says, hey, you, we should, you know, we desire to live perfect, but we can't. We're failures. We, 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 we break the law of God. But God sent his son lived a perfect life, did not break the law at once. Not once did he break the law. And he went to the cross for us. He who knew no sin became sin for us is what the Bible says. He went in your place and in my place. My friends, that is the grace of God. And this grace of God and this, which, which we get this understanding of the union now of, of Christ that we have all because of his grace results, the results should be a life you know, reflecting Christ. It should reflect in your actions. As Paul even says in Ephesians in chapter number, uh, chapter number five, verse number one, he says, be imitators of God as dear children. Be imitators of God as dear children. In chapter number five, in verse number eight, he says, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. No longer in darkness, but walk as children of the light. Imitate God as dear children. You see, so understanding all of these things, it should affect our actions, how we live our life. The changed life because of God's grace, the changed life. See, God's grace changes people, changes me, changes you. And a change doesn't happen overnight. It's a continual growth. We work out our own salvation. Day by day, we grow. We should be. And we grow in God's grace. And as we grow in God's grace, a changed life, it, it results in a, as being a beloved brother or sister and a faithful servant. Just as Tychicus was a beloved brother and a faithful servant. And it's all because of the grace of God. My prayer for all of us is that we would understand that grace, that we would walk in it, receive it, that we would ask God, the Holy Spirit, God, would you show me? See, because I know that some of us are still challenged with our past. You know, the, are still, still, still challenged with all of our faults and our failures. You know, I believe in God, but I got this. I believe in God, but I got that. Hey, let me tell you something. Well, you got that, you got this, whatever it is, confess it before the Lord. Ask God, hey God, I'm confessing this. I'm leaving it to you. I'm giving it to you. I'm surrendering it to you. I don't want to take possession of it no longer. I don't want that to, I, I don't want to be identified in my sin. I want to be identified in Christ. 
I don't wanna be identified in my past or in my failures or in my faults. I wanna be identified in Christ. See, and when we understand the grace of God, when you confess Jesus, that's who you are. And you don't have to walk in your past no longer, in your faults, in your failures, in your pain, in your challenges, those things that break your heart. You don't have to. You don't have to. You can choose today to say, you know what, Lord? I'm giving it to you. And by God's grace, not only will he forgive you, but he'll give you the power to walk in it and to live it. God's grace changes people. Father, thank you so much for your living word, for the power of your word, for the declaration of your word. And I pray, God, that you, Lord, are right now ministering to hearts, touching people's lives, opening the eyes of their heart to your grace, that they would understand how much you love them and how you, God, desire for them, for us, for me. And we would understand the power that's available to us through your spirit to actually be that beloved brother, that beloved sister, faithfully serving you. Would you open our eyes? We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.